HV show here on Island City where the beach meets the streets and your Hollywood radio show for personal development. We are featuring on this episode of the Coach V show, Brother T. Kinney Kinney, as he talks to us about appreciation, gratitude, honoring the culture, and making sure that you continue to move forward in full appreciation. Appreciation to me means so many different things, but there's a poem that you can Google that says, you know, gratitude and appreciation, right? It turns what we have into a nothing more. It can turn a meal into a feast, a house into a home, and a stranger into a friend. I mean, that's just a powerful feeling that Deacon Deacon is going to share throughout his whole journey of success and his experiences that he's going to share for us in terms of life lessons to subscribe to them should we find value and deploy it all over what we do. Thank you to T. Kenny Kenny for coming on the show. That's all for me today. Enjoy this episode of the Coach V Show right after a word from our sponsors. Souls is more than just for saving your floors. It also prevents heel bruises and pains from unbalanced cleats. Hi, my name is Daniel Bruckner. I'm a private practice uh, pediatrician here in Southern California, as well as the chair of pediatrics at um, uh, Providence Cedar sinai Tarzana Hospital and a good friend of Wendy's and also the pediatrician of her children. And I'd like to uh, take this time to support her product, Souls. Um, I think it's an amazing product that will benefit children greatly. And uh, every day we see kids come from soccer practice, things like that. They don't want to uh, take off their cleats. So they come in and, and I've seen uh, accidents, I've seen sprained ankles, I've seen hurt heels, and I think that this Souls product will really uh, help uh, prevent those from happening, uh, not only as a pediatrician, but also as a consumer. I can't wait to get the product for myself and for my children. I think it's something that should be owned by every athlete across the country, and um, I really hope that uh, everyone goes and buys it and enjoys it. Thank you. Souls will have memory foam and TPE mesh that will wrap around the cleats. After showing my product to my professional friends, I realized one thing. This isn't a product people want, it's a product people need. Souls, taking you from the cleats to the streets. Welcome to the Coach V Show, your Hollywood radio show for personal development with expert insights and interviews to help you, me, and we work to be our best and live our best life, bringing to you the success frameworks of behavioral models and life lessons that should you find value in them, that you deploy it all over your life, leadership, and business, powered by Island City Media, where the beach meets the streets, and Dash Radio Hollywood Studios, Hollywood, California. Today, I'm so excited to bring on the show a brother that I have highly admired, respected, and quite a fan of his uh, for almost two decades now. I met brother T. Muli Suliafu Kinikini years ago, and his parents are from the kingdom of Tonga. The villages are Kolomotua, Maufanga, Niwa, Nomuka, um, and then uh, Taoa and Uiha. Immigrated to the United States in the early 60s to La Ie, shout out North Shore in La Ie, Hawaii, to Pomona, California, in Salt Lake City, Utah, in 1967. Shout out Pomona 909 and shout out Salt Lake City. Born in Pomona, California, raised in Salt Lake City in Glendale Rose Park area and in Utah. Graduated from the East High School. Shout out East. I think so. New Tafisi, my cousin, went to, to yep. East, too. Yep. They all came right? there. Yeah, yeah. So So Nufo was from there. Shout out to So Nufo Snow College, University of Utah, with an emphasis on social science and substance abuse. Portland State Online for civic engagement. His hobbies are, like Coach V, family time. I don't power lift, but he's very good at it. Power lifting, rugby, football, and coaching from the stands. <laughs> Cookouts, camping, and community service. His current role per stated by Mr. T. Kenny Kin himself. He's a self-proclaimed husband, father, uncle, free Uber, DoorDash, chef, therapist, referee, gardener, et cetera, at home. And he's at the University of Utah currently with scholarship EDI for Pacific Islander programs and is an athletic liaison. He is a business owner, New Heights Management, family services, mentorship, scholarships, community, island, and 
connect connection, which are his world renowned Terry patties that are sold all mostly on the weekends, but you can pick it up anytime with an order from D. And then he says that when his, when he grows up, his goal is I want to do everything that I am already doing every day. Love God and love your neighbor. Sorry, nothing too exciting. Welcome to the show, your boy from the U in Salt Lake City via Pomona, La Ia, and everywhere else that has good peoples and good food. Your boy, T. Kenny Kenny on the show. Brother T, thanks for coming on, man. Right on, Coach V. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. Man, an thank honor you for you. squeezing me in the track. All of the things that you do on, 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 you know, there at the U, what you do with our brother Ale Mateo and all poly sports. I mean, there's just so much that you do. But welcome to the show. I've already introduced you, but what would you consider your genesis point? What's your start point? Where are you from? How do you want to start professional or personal, Brother T? Uh, you know what? Um, I think uh, the real D is uh, the person that... Uh, is uh, not written on a card or a business card or anything. <clears throat> Just myself, my family, my background, my faith, my my community. That's that's who I really am. Um, of course, I enjoy the the things where they write my name on a card and I get to pass it around and uh, helps feed mm. my family. But other than that, I'm I'm nobody very special here. <clears throat> Normal person that does things on an excellence level abnormally well. That's Brother T, Kenny, Kenny, right there. T, talk about being born in Pomona and just start us off with your upbringing and your childhood. Right. You know, the crazy thing about it, uh, uh, Coach, I, uh, I was born in Pomona, California. Mm. My parents were in transition coming from La Ia while having their eye on moving with family. To Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. I was born, and then uh, a few weeks later, my grandparents took me to Salt Lake, raised me in Salt Lake City. So I don't know anything too much except for I know where Pomona Valley Hospital is. Yes, sir. Gary uh, Avenue off the 10 right freeway. There off the 10 freeway. Yes, sir. Every chance I go through there, I kind of uh, have a small kind of connection to, to Pomona. But ever since then, uh, I go back often. I love the people in Pomona. And uh, always proud to to say I was born at Pomona Valley Hospital, right off the 10 freeway, uh, but raised here in Salt Lake. Yeah. And talk about your Rose Park West Valley upbringing, and then how that all went, and what was your experiences as a kid? Like what what junior high you went to, what elementary school before we get to high school? Sure. So <clears throat> back then, before it was really known as Rose Park. Mm. We lived in what they in the, the, the Tongan community and the Samoan community. We knew that to be uh, or call that the airport area mm. because it was close to the airport. Right. Uh, we lived off of Morton Drive and uh, with multiple families in our home. Um, we had a family who had come over and gotten jobs in the uh, mid 60s, early 60s, and then layers and layers of the Kinney Kinney family. Uh, made their way to the Great Salt Lake, and uh, many of us are still here. And there's a small little pocket right there, right next to the airport. That's Rose Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, later moved to the other track side of the tracks, was just a half a mile away, which is the Glendale area. So attended uh, Edison Elementary right there in Glendale, and then went on to Glendale Junior High School. Um, and then. Uh, I went one year to what they call South High School. Mm -hmm. And it was the last year was open. And they closed down the school due to a lot of financial and, and population. Uh, there wasn't as many students, et cetera, et cetera. So they decided to close down that school and kind of feed the other schools in the district. <clears throat> and we were selected to go to East High School, which... Uh, we had to catch the bus a little bit earlier than everybody else mm. and uh, and I go to this uh, school on the hill, which is approximately about 20 to 25 minute drive from uh, from our home. But that was an experience itself. So 
originally South High School, which is now known as Salt Lake Community College, right, uh, West Campus, and then uh, graduated at uh, East High School three years uh, going there. So, well, what what are what are some of your fond memories? Uh, and I share that experience uh, with you of multiple families living in one home, staying in a garage, um, all of us sharing the rooms. I mean, on Sundays particularly. You know, the boys, we would just shower in the hose outside, (laughs) you know, with our shorts on because there was not enough bathrooms in the house. Talk about some fond memories and some life lessons that you would share with us about how to coexist. Uh, No, no private space. Hati, remember, you know what I mean? No no privacy. Always. It it was almost scary when I was by myself in my house. Like, what's going on? Come on, T. Talk about fond memories and some life lessons growing up in such a shared communal space, multiple people in one home. You know, as I look back, when I was young, I didn't know any different. I thought that was yeah. normal, right? Right, right, right. Um, find a corner of the, the basement uh, living room, grab your blanket and stuff and tuck yourself in. Uh, dinners and stuff like that. As soon as you smell cooking, you know it was close to dinner. Yeah. We all had our roles. We had a little garden in the back, which was awesome. But it just felt like we always had people coming to the home. Yeah. And when you heard, oh, uncle and them are here, you kind of had an idea. Great. They're going to stay with us for a little bit. And then when they leave, it was kind of bittersweet, right? Mm-hmm. Sharing everything, hand me downs, everything like that. Um, uh, we had a lot of the, the Kitty Kitty family live within that Glendale area. So we would share that family or whoever was coming into town. Uh, uh, and to this day, Man, some of the greatest memories are eating off the same plate, right? Mm. That often, eating off the same plate. Never knew that we were, we didn't have a lot. We didn't have video games or anything, so we were often in the streets playing. Um, of course, all the horse playing as boys, you know, you want to you want to be the toughest guy or the older boys try to make you tougher. And Yes, sir. A lot of chores in the garden. Um just a, just a wonderful uh, upbringing. And then here's the probably the greatest thing I remember is knowing how I'm connected to family members, right? Mm. Genealogy, singing, uh, family home evenings where we would sing with them, um, attending and learning, uh, attending uh, uh, family parties, or weddings, funerals, learning how to, uh, l- learning my role, my role in the family. Uh, preparing food, cooking, how to clean uh, animals and uh, and how to cook and, and be grateful about it. And it was kind of like the cool thing to do, right? It was cool to go and and uh, and tune and, and the puaca right? or clean yeah, the yeah. puaca, right? It was yeah. cool to pull out the guts in front of uh, everybody, like, like you knew how to do it. Then yeah, when yeah. you go to the garden, it was cool to, uh, not at that time, I thought, but know how to guard it, you know, how to plant things, when to harvest things. Um, a lot of gold nuggets from my grandparents who raised me. My mom and dad were always working and they kind of took the job that the most available job that didn't require too much uh, English or education. Um, I often, uh, I often uh, uh, remember a smell or a scent when uh, my parents got home mm. because uh, they would, uh, my dad had a job, my mom had a job. Then in the evening time, they'd come and pick us up and we'd go clean people's yards. Yeah. And uh, I didn't understand that at the time until some of those people's homes were some of my friends from school. Hey, D, what are you doing there, man? Hey, what's going on? And I'd be mowing lawns or cleaning up their trash and stuff. And I didn't really understand that until I got older, how grateful I was that they instilled upon me upon being respectful of them and being grateful to have work. So mm-hmm. those are some of the gold nuggets I kind of took growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Man, people still ask me today, uh, cause you and I, I, I believe are that, um, we all have our challenges, but I really choose to be very positive, optimistic, not just in my posting and my social media world. But uh, when people meet me, they're like, man, how can you be so positive? I was like, man, because because uh, gratitude, being grateful has been so good to me. Come on, T, can you elaborate on that? I mean, whatever it is that we had, 
I was grateful for. Um, you know, back in the days, in the first day of school, like junior high, early high school, until my father's business started doing well, I was a sophomore in high school then. But like uh, people would buy brand new shoes. Flow hose were like five bucks or <laughs> 10 bucks at Miller's Outpost. Remember flow hose? Oh, yeah. Remember the Man, that was your I'm going to go back the- even, even before that. We used to uh, we used to rock pro wings. Pro right? wings, oh bro, pay less pro wings all day, man. To, you know, two 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 for twenty dollars. I get a church <laughs> shoe and a sneaker. Come on, man. And, and, but I mean, I just found that being grateful yeah. just unlocks so much. Come on, T. That's a powerful life lesson. Talk about how powerful it was then for you and and today, T. Absolutely, man. You know, uh, Coach, one of the one of the things that I'll never forget. So my grandfather was in a wheelchair and he had an action mm-hmm. back in Tola when he came here. And so he made his money sometimes on the weekends. He and his younger brothers would go play. He was very good on every string instrument. Mm-hmm. So they had a little band and their little band kind of turned into having a little Polynesian show here in Salt Lake City. And uh, his youngest brother, Casini, um, and his brother, uh, Pita, and his other brothers, they would, they formed this little band and had a little Polynesian group. And everybody wanted it. And uh, I would remember um, going on weekends and pushing him all over the neighborhood, all over Salt Lake area. Um, and just being grateful how people, uh, how he approached things. We were collecting cans uh, regularly. As soon as we, we uh, start for the road, we'd have two big, large bags. Mm. And we'd be walking and he would say, he would say, Devita, Kempa, Kempa, which means <laughs> that it was his way of saying there's a can over there. And I'd, <laughs> I'd be running. I was so excited. And I have a little brother. I need to go with me. And we kind of like compete. Who would, uh, we can get the most cans. Right. And then uh, just coming home and knowing that uh, uh, not, not many people had a garden. And we did it for, uh, I, you know, I just thought, for a while, hey, look, this unique that we have a garden. But we grew everything. We grew from peppers to uh, to corn to tomatoes to all sorts of things. And we didn't have to go to the store very often. Mm. It would be like, okay, you can smell the boiling water. And now it's time to go get the, clean it all off, the vegetables, pick the ones, how to pick them. I mean, it was a humbling experience. But as I grew up, I appreciated uh, how uh, frugal my family was. The hand-me-downs was incredible. I couldn't wait to get some of my cousins and, and, and brothers' clothes. Uh-huh. Uh, and that's going to be mine next. That's going to be mine next, you know. And, and just be really, uh, be really grateful uh, to rock those things. And then when we didn't have, I'll tell you, my village was very uh, mindful. Um, mm-hmm. I grew up a little bit bigger than the ever, other guys. And so... Uh, just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. <laughs> those guys... <laughs> Kind of said, oh, that's not going to fit thee. This will fit thee. You know, and I uh, I have a wonderful. So all my cousins that I grew up are actually my uncles. Mm. They're my dad's first cousins. And so they would live. They just live right around us. And every time they came, they would drop some clothes, drop some this and that. And, uh, yeah, those are humble beginnings. You never knew that uh, chicken be, can be made like 150 different ways. Yeah, yeah. By our mothers, right? Um, and then when you felt like, golly, that's that's it right there. And we still have people that are in our living room with nobody's. That's where the broth really stretches. Right. And yeah, a little yeah. extra potato or two on your plate. Uh, I never uh, never did. I never did. I ever feel like we went without or we didn't have. Right? Yes, sir. I, I, I joke with my kids all the time. I was like, grandma was like Bubba in Forrest Gump. <laughs> it was like chicken curry, chicken barbecue, fried chicken, baked chicken, <laughs> every kind of every kind That's of. That's absolutely that exactly it. right. Right on. The Come list. on, bro. Then you take the baked chicken and it's breakfast, and my my kids are like, "Wait, you guys eat that for breakfast?" Oh, you know when you grow up the way we did, kids. There's no particular food for a particular time. It's just you ate what was available and you called it breakfast. <laughs> Break the fast, right? Come on, T. Exactly. Anything else you'd like to talk about that in terms of gratitude, hand-me-downs? Um, man, being frugal, I love that word. And I don't think that's a bad word. 
um, because I think, uh, you know, with the national debt where it is today, and then, uh, you know, the just rate of just uh, people being in debt in terms of the general public or the national debt. I mean, a lot of us buy stuff and me particularly as well. We would buy things and and lavish in things that we don't need. Anything else before we move on from there to high school? No, I, th I think that's great. I, I, I think the biggest thing also remembering as a young child is like when we would go to get together, we would do these things uh, right at the end when you kind of feel like, okay, they're going to say a family prayer and everybody's going to leave. So we would do things like uh, go ask uncle, uncle, okay, or our parents, can we go sleep over? Can we sleep over? Can yeah, yeah, sleep yeah, over? yeah, yeah. That's right. That was pretty big back in the days, if you remember. Um, and it was awesome to go. And we'd go and whatever home that we're at, they treated us no different. They didn't treat us like guests or anything. You get up when we're going to Yate, you get up when they go clean up. Yep. If you did something wrong or somebody else, everybody gets the the the, the, the hand for that one. But most <laughs> of all, it was just, uh, we were never treated different. It didn't matter where we were at. We just continue to feel a love growing up, you know. Now talk about going to East, transitioning, switching your mindset, becoming more competitive. Talk about being an athlete, a student athlete. Well, when did that all happen? And talk us through that. So when I was at South High School uh, as a freshman, I got to play. Uh, I thought I was cool because they uh, invited me to come out and play varsity. Wow, as a uh, freshman, right? As a freshman. I, I, I quickly realized what they needed was a dummy out there so they can hit. I was on the scout team as a freshman over there. And that kind of toughened me up, but I thought I was pretty cool. One of the yeah, yeah. freshmen that were invited to go to varsity, but I found out they say, well, stand right there. And then uh, so-and-so is going to come and tackle you. Anyway, <laughs> um, when we made that transition, we we're pretty sad. They divided up our school into three schools. Mm. Uh, East High School, West High School, and Highland High School. Right. And the Glendale Park portion of the valley got bust about 45 minutes before everybody else got up to go to East High School. Then the bus will go take pick up the kids in the area. It was quite a transition because of predominantly white uh, high school on the East Bench. Right. Where, um, total different socioeconomic status. Um, just, uh, it was brand new. It was, uh, we didn't know how to, um, what to say, what to do. Even, even the staff, it was difficult. The counselors that were there supposed to help us. Um, but over time, I think it made me a stronger person. Right. Mm. It helped me to navigate better. It helped me to uh, sharpen some of my communication skills. Even though I was a sophomore, I would hear people, oh, you should go to this person. They could help. And that's usually how Polynesians get along and, and people from underrepresented communities. There's someone that they kind of gravitate to, right? And they trust. Yes, sir. Yes, and so sir. they tell everybody about it, right? So... They were, uh, you know, during that transition, outside of football, when it came to football, we ate everybody's lunch. Mm. And, you know, um, we weren't that good. Oh, let me just get that out. We weren't the time where, like, a few years later when the Pohas and the Kalfushis came in. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. kind of ran things. We yeah. kind of set it up. I like to tell them, hey, we kind of set that foundation up. I remember we were in the Sports Illustrated for the longest losing streak in the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. And then we broke it, all right? We broke it on my senior year. And uh, then after uh, a couple of years later, these guys were state champions. Mm -hmm. and uh, Kind of kept that tradition on too. But uh, that transition itself, Coach, was, uh, as I see it in my line of work right now, is that uh, depending on your mindset, uh, uh, how you approach things is really the end result of how things will go. If you come in there with a chippy attitude or just a not very positive attitude, and, you know, stigmas and all sorts of things, it's going to stick with you. It's going to be there for a while. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough that I had some really good friends and uh, surrounded myself with good people and, and asked a lot of questions, right? Mm -hmm. Something that we don't like to do a lot is ask for help or ask questions. And then as time went, I, you know, you kind of figure it out. Uh, 
didn't need too much uh, holding hand, but we kind of knew who to go to, who not to go to, what to do, which classes to go to. And uh, But when uh, it was after school, that's where I feel where a lot of changes happened, where we were really getting to know uh, uh, players and people from the other side of town, other side of town. In a, in a way, it was similar to to what we learned, what we saw and learned in Remember the Titans, right? Not that bad, but there were some similarities. But as time went along, we became closer. Some of my, one of my business partners today is a young man who lives in Arizona. And uh, we chop it up regularly. And uh, his family had millions and millions of dollars. And I didn't even know how many zeros are in a million. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we're still friends till today. So that transition, um, I think it was the mindset, how I was raised to stay humble and, and not get mad and don't get offended so easily, right? Right, right, right. Don't, don't, don't get offended so easily. Somebody do something, hey, you know, uh, let's, let's take a step back and kind of look at it. But I took that approach along with having a ton of cousins. You know, when they closed our school, all of us went together. So it was cool. And, and so talk about the fond memories. I mean, and, and if you could, I mean, share how it felt like to break the losing streak. Well, um, I remember very clearly, and we still joke about it today. So we broke our losing streak against a school that I've been passionate and love. Absolutely. I've spent the last uh, nearly 20 years at West High School. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. at that time, they were they were eating everybody's lunch, right? West High School had the Asimohis, the Esilau Climis, the Brian Messinas, the Solovis, the Avas, the Ionos. I mean, the list goes on. These guys were bad. Right. These guys were bad, right? Um, and so we played it, and everybody's like, oh, there's no way. But uh, you know how it is when, when, when there's Polynesians on the other side of the ball. Hey, you guys are hugging and kissing before the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as that whistle goes, it's on. It's on. I'm gonna break your head off. I'm coming <laughs> at you full steam, no breaks. So uh, we went uh, four overtimes with what? West High School in 1990, and uh, we had news channels even like stop their thing, and they're there. Everybody's filming. It's, it's the oldest rivalry in Utah. It's right, the oldest rivalry. So we're playing and playing, and uh, we get into the fourth overtime. We we stop them, and everybody rushes the field. I'm exhausted because at that time, we're playing both ways. And uh, one of my good friends, his name is uh, Henry Kaufusi, mm. and uh, and uh, uh, Sean and Mila, two of my good mates, and then a young man who has already passed already, uh, Viriami Latu. He was on West High's team, and we're all – they're all helping me get up, helping me, and all of a sudden, this big old camera comes in my face, and they're like, "Hey, hey, D, what, what? How do you feel? How do you feel?" And I'm like so exhausted, and everybody's cheering and everything, and all I can remember is somebody saying, "This, we're gonna take state." We're gonna take state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we only won a couple more games after that. We did take state, but it was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you what, man, uh, football, uh, outside of, uh, you know, I wasn't a, uh, a very good football player, but it sure taught me a lot of lessons. Man. Yes, sir. And uh, so, yeah. So, <coughs> you set the foundation over at East, right? So, definitely that guy set up set up the, the mindset of the goal and the objective should be stated, right? <laughs> and then so you, you go from there, you set the foundation there, and, and what comes next? Talk about college. I mean, for me, I took the SATs because everybody else took the SATs. There was no real urging or motivation uh, from my house because nobody nobody went to college in my in my house. You know, my parents didn't know much about it. So I took a PSAT one time on a Saturday because everybody else was taking a PSAT as a junior. I really didn't even apply to college, right? Talk about how how, how you were able to navigate all of that and and go transition into college, D. So um, as I got older um, at school, um, 
I uh, I played center, mm. and uh, I uh, I got a couple. A lot of the guys that played around me, the Kalfusis, the Milas, the Smiths, they were getting uh, people looking at them. Right. And I probably was on the corner of the screen of one of those highlights, right, or one of their visits, and they said, "Wow, he can snap the ball." And so uh, I, I started getting stronger and confident in in my training, especially with other people. Uh, lifting heavy weight was the technique. I started really getting it and understanding mm -hmm. it. And um, I got a couple letters. I got a couple letters, and uh, and that was from Weber State University and Utah State University. Right. And in those years, right there, Coach, uh, um, they weren't doing very well. Right. They weren't right. like. <laughs> So I hate to say this and I'm embarrassed to say it, but when we get the letters and the coach would start calling letters of the schools and stuff, when they come to those letters and they call my name, I kind of like hide and kind of pretend I didn't hear that, you know, yeah. or I would hide the letters, you know. Yeah. Now, phew, those are the two top programs right there. And yeah, anyway, exactly. Um, a lot of people were talking about the tests. And the, back in the days when you and I were playing, uh, you know, it was known as the clearinghouse, but it wasn't uh, – it wasn't really set and strict as it was right now. Yeah, I right. Take test. I was set up for taking. I never took it. Graduation came around. Um, they offered back in the day. I think you remember when they used to call it uh, Prop Forty Eight, right? Yeah, remember Prop Forty Eight. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the uh, so um, I decided I was going to uh, Prop Forty Eight through Utah State. Right. And when it got closer, that they told me what was going to happen. Basically, I'm going to sit out for a year or so, get caught up with everything. And if I can get to that level, then I can start coming up. Well, I didn't. Uh, all my friends were going to Dixie College yeah. at the time. And uh, I was kind of just stuck in the middle of what I'm going to do. I didn't have any uh, money to pay for school or anything. And then one of my uh, one of my mentors uh, through my youth and even till to this very day, his name is Richard Kaufushi. Um, Richard Kaufushi was playing at BYU at the time, and everything he did, I try to mimic. And uh, his uh, one of uh, our other young men leaders, Sam Tausinga, those two, uh, uh, and Sam Brown, those three people had some of the greatest influences. Uh, they didn't know that at the time, but I kind of watch and mimic everything they did. Sam and uh, both Sam's Brown and Sam Tausinga ended up going to University of Utah. And uh, at that time, Rich was playing at BYU. Um, I would ask him questions about a lot of things, about how they got there, what they were studying, uh, all those small things. And um, when they, when they came down to it, I had a good conversation with Rich. I told him that uh, I didn't want to go to Utah state to sit out for a year and get it up. I, I didn't feel academically uh, that I was ready for that. And going to Logan, I don't know anybody in Logan. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then um, he said, hey, I, I don't know if it's a good idea for you to go to Dixie State or to Dixie at the time, Dixie College. He goes, uh, and that time everybody's going to Dixie because of all the fun that was happening at Dixie. Yeah, yeah. He goes, uh, I, I want you to uh, think about attending a school just down the street. Yeah, it's called Snow College. Uh -huh. And at that time, I was telling myself, Snow College, there's not even a stoplight over there. <laughs> yeah. In my head, I was thinking, oh, there's no way I want to go to Snow College. Long story short, I had a family member that had come down off his mission, and he had, around that same time, and he encouraged me to go with him as he was going to play at Snow College. And uh, that was my, the turning point in my life right there. Coach was... Um, listening to people that um, had their best interests and mm. can see the potentials and knowing that there are probably a little bit more distractions than I could handle down South. He encouraged me to go to this small school in a small town because uh, one of his sisters was attending that school and a lot of the family of the Kaufushi family and the Guafu family that have made their way over there, the Wolfgrams. And so I went out there for a trip. Uh, to just go move my cousin in. And when I got there, I felt it. This is where I'm supposed to be at. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly where I'm supposed to be at. So we moved him in and uh, he was going home. And on our way home, I said, hey, I want to come here. I want to go with you. But uh, I don't know how to 
do a lot of things. So, again, navigating the system, finding out who the coaches were at that time. Paul Tidwell was coaching there with uh, Coach Uparesa mm. and uh, Alan Salanoa and uh, Bronco uh, Mendenhall and uh, a lot of great people uh, there at Snow College. So uh, I came. I came over there and uh, – um, again, I was a, the dummy. I started late. I went into, uh, football. I made a team and, and, uh, met a lot of lifetime friends and, uh, really changed my life, uh, my focus. And, um, so that, yeah, that was, that, that has been one of the best journeys and decisions that I've ever made in my life. Yeah. 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 So I talk about that because, I think a lot of people make more of the transition between high school and college, which there is a transition and a learning curve. Um, but and then they make it to where the transition between college and pros, my NFL guys now that I talk to and that are friends or have been around, I, I ask them this a, a lot as well. So how, how big was the transition between the place it is that I was at Boise State and then the, the NFL, they said, man, the transition was a lot easier. When you come from high school to college or junior college or D2, D3 school at that, the, the learning curve is so much greater. And then the jump and the, the acclimation to the schedule, the intensity of training, the time demands of waking up early, lifting weights, that was greater than it was when they jumped from college to playing in the NFL. And obviously, that's a different level of athlete altogether in comparison to a lot of other examples. But how was that for you? Was that just like a shock for you where now you go from this communal living, right, right. Uh, going to East High School, and then now it's like on you? Um, and then you had to figure things out on your own. Talk about that transition. Was there a struggle? And what's your thoughts on that, T? So when I first got to Snow College, um, there were some dudes over there. And yeah. one of the guys that I, uh, I enjoyed watching and is still a good friend today is uh, Brand Boyer. Uh-huh. Boyer. What's that? Yeah, Brand Boyer. Yeah, remind me who Brand Boyer was. So Brand Boyer, he played inside linebacker. He was uh, for somewhere in the country areas of uh, Utah. Yep. He went on to play uh, at the uh, – was it the Desert Storm is what they call it. Yeah, yeah, at Arizona, Arizona. yeah, for to for Tormy. And then he went on to the league for over a dozen years. Right? Wow. And uh, I think till to, uh, just a couple of years ago, he was actually on the coaching staff for a while. Yep. One of the toughest guys I've ever – but I, I saw I saw people, right? And the way that we did it, we, we lifted in our weightlifting class in high school, and then we went after school, and we would lift until we got tired. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no condition, right? And that yeah, yeah. was it. That was the extent of that training. Two of days back in the day it was terrible. Yeah, I yeah. They were just trying to filter everybody out who they didn't want to have on the team or whatever, but it was exhausting, as you know. Yep. The jump from college was more organized, right? They had right. schedules. That's um, right. Morning till night. They had meetings. But during all these things, I felt like I belonged because – how the brotherhood is in that locker room. And of course, I was a freshman, all these sophomore guys were doing their things. And then it was awesome to hear where they were going after Snow College. Yeah, right. Arizona's, BYU's, Utah's, and so forth. And that was pretty exciting. But one of the biggest things that I learned is watching people be uh, uh, dedicated to their training, their diet. Yeah. And, and uh, what they did when we weren't at the stadium or when we weren't with the team, what they did right. outside of that. Um, I love that. I like watching uh, people's bodies change and how they got stronger. There were some areas that I felt confident because I, I came in and I, I was stronger than some of those sophomores, you know, then there's some areas that I knew I could increase my, my endurance on and things. And so I had a lot of great people around me, but it was a huge jump. Um, right. Watching what I ate, when I slept, um, the schedules, and then how the coaches talk to you, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Holy moly, man. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. When, when, the, 
one of the coaches that mad at me, his name was uh, uh, Rick Wilson, and he played with Rich Kaufushi. And I had to ask myself, hey, man, you went to BYU? You... <laughs> I would tease him about it. You know, you know how it is, man. The language is not uh, as nice. That's right. But it was uh, also the intensity. Like, he would be right here in my face at times if I missed a block or, or, or anything like that. But I think those are the the uh, the toughest thing is to kind of adjust to is the schedules, the, you know, how to be a better student of the game. Um, and then all my roommates, they were awesome. We'd come right. home and I would ask him questions. Uh, we had some studs playing. Uh, what was also cool is seeing uh, playing with kids from other schools that you were ripping their head off in Utah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then having kids from every state and then even as far as American Samoa. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and that was fun. That was really fun. There was a culture at Snow College that um, was very inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. Very inclusive. Uh, I'll be honest, I was homesick for home-cooked meals. Um, I didn't have a scholarship at first. And then learning how to pick up a financial aid and other grants and stuff and and then participating in the Polynesian Club. Uh, Coach Upress and them helped alleviate the cost um, until we were able to have something more steady, you know. <clears throat> and you never know such thing as full rides in uh, small schools. Yeah, so they yeah. would divide up certain scholarships and maybe it was helping with uh, housing or helping out with tuition or so forth. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I did that for a year and then uh, I had left for a, uh, a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I was uh, called to um, Los Angeles, California during the riots. You served in L.A.? I served in L.A. I did. Uh, during, during Rodney King? So I was watching Rodney King one day in uh, the summer of 92. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my mission call came like two, three weeks later. And I told myself, man, that would be one crazy place to be right now. <laughs> my mission calls comes in about two weeks after the riot started. And says you're going to Los Angeles, California. I went Tongan speaking and uh, ended up serving in the Samoan program most of the time. But I, uh, yeah, I was there from '92 to beginning of '95. What ward? What ward were you in? So where you live at? That's actually a different mission called Arcadia. Yep. I spent most of my time in Carson. In Carson. And in, in Long Long Beach was the furthest I went towards. Right. You. But uh, downtown L.A., of course, during that whole time, um, when the courts and everything were going, they uh, brought a lot of us uh, Pacific Islanders into the area. They, little did they know, especially in the ghetto south and uh, central, uh, south central and north central, all the over that area, they love missionaries, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they love people. No matter what church you're teaching, they love missionaries, you know, so. Really enjoyed my experience in Los Angeles. Serve amongst the Samoan people. The majority of my mission, uh, the Tongan programs in Inglewood, in uh, the Westchester area, yeah. uh, the whole Inglewood. And we covered, and we actually, before I left, we opened back up Watts. Yeah, yeah. The area that wow. shut down, you know? So um, fond memories were to eat there. Where, where would you eat there? Where would you eat there? Besides the spaghetti and getting fed at the homes, where are some oh, spots easy, that you man. eat? Louis Burger. Louis Burger, man. Where was that at? Paramount. In Paramount. Oh, In Paramount. Yeah. yeah. Go there and grab some chili cheese fries with some pastrami or shrimp on that. And it's the chili over there, man. And nothing else to do is the chili. But everything, everywhere in L.A., you know, these... These uh, Latino uh, little stops, these little taco places. Yeah. LA is, that is truly the city of angels right there. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. And then and then from there, you served your mission. Where'd you go next, Steve? Uh, after my mission, I returned home and I uh, finished up at Snow College. I finished up at Snow College. I took a few trips, uh, Weber State, Utah, uh, some of the smaller schools, um, Redlands, I came out to California, um, and then uh, uh, Southern Utah is where okay. I decided to go. Uh, Coach Alemont. Cedar City? Is Southern Utah? 
Cedar City. I let Mattel had some great ties over there. And uh, I took uh, with one of my cousins, Kingi Langi. We took a recruiting trip over there. And uh, we committed to Southern Utah. And we loved it. We absolutely was excited to go. And that summer, I, I went to camp. And my, my brother, Kingi, got married. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he got to stay in Pro Bowl. And then um, right before our first game, uh, well, there's a whole new coaching staff that was there. They kind of flushed the whole program at that time. Uh, but right before, right after, uh, right after um, camp, um, leading into the week of game one, my grandfather, who raised me, he had a uh, very – he had a terrible stroke. Mm. And so I called a coach and I explained to him, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to head home. I'm, uh, I'm not coming back. And he said, uh, Hey, why don't you, um, why don't you go home, take some time off, take care of that. And I, I just knew the way I was raised. I, I wasn't coming back. Mm. He needed me more than he needed me at home more than I needed to be at school at that time. So mm. I, uh, I packed my things and I left and uh, I never came back. I came home, um, took care of grandpa. He went through his therapy for about uh, four months at the LDS hospital. And then um, shortly after that, um, I enrolled at Salt Lake Community College mm -hmm. for a semester. And then I transferred to the University of Utah. And then uh, when I got here, uh, football was done for me. Um, and I jumped on and, and played rugby here at mm -hmm. the University of Utah. Um, played some powerlifting. Where did the powerlifting come in? So um, in 19, so this was right around 1996. Okay. And uh, in 1997, I had an uncle of mine, a couple of them, um, that was powerlifting or training people by the name of uh, Saya Pope and uh, Jaime. Um, they, uh, asked me to, uh, we ran into each other at the gym and then they got their guys to sponsor me. And so, uh, I got into learning how to properly lift heavyweight and wear these funny tight shirts that <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't like wearing. It took like three people to put on my shirt when I go to tournaments and stuff, you know? But uh, I competed out here. I started in 1997 uh, through 2004. And nice. um, at the same time I was there, I was playing in some small leagues, uh, rugby here at the University of Utah, and then some of the Polynesian club teams uh, out here. And then um, so powerlifting uh, for the region. And then I uh, took uh, some high school kids and, we did some fun things. We competed national, uh, locally, our region. We competed nationals, and then we were invited to Worlds. Uh, I went to Worlds twice. Wow. <laughs> Where was that at? Where was the Worlds held at? In Las Vegas. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, it was fun. Um, and what did that teach you? What's a life lesson that you can grasp from, from like going to the highest level of something? please so um powerlifting is different than strongman i want to get that out there yep yep, the yep. strong man they're doing all these things and that's a real sport right there <laughs> right, right, right. it's uh it's it's a it's a it's such a rewarding sport because your pr everybody celebrates it yeah and yeah. although i'll go in there and i'll look on the on the chart and see who all the guys who are registered and who they're lifting. Then we weigh in. It's kind of like wrestling, right? Mm -hmm. It'll be like 400 pounds and then lift 400 pounds. That is really nothing. It's more impressive when somebody lighter is lifting a heavier weight. Right. And so as I got into it and I felt the confidence, my training got better and my technique was getting better and get, just getting comfortable with things. Um, I, I love the sport of powerlifting because everybody cheers everybody on. And when you come off, everybody's reaching to help you take your shirt off uh, or put your shirt on. Everybody's asking you and sharing. Um, so, the, so the meets that we have, um, it's like a small community, right? Mm, small mm. Community. 
I didn't excel there until I had gotten married and my uh, dear wife, Nii, um, was like my biggest motivator. Like um, uh, I could throw weight across the, the meat over there, just hearing her and seeing her. And I, and I thought that was a, interesting for me because um, powerlifting, you re- there's nobody else there with you. There's nobody else except your spotter. And then he has to step away, right? And you've got to put all your trust in everything that you've learned because there's a risk and stuff you may drop the weight on you or you, your body may go out and stuff. So you've really got to trust in your inner self and your inner, uh, you gotta, you gotta respect your, your weaknesses, right? And know, okay, you know, I can't go this, I can't do that. But having good people in your corner, oh my goodness. Uh, we'd go at one time I went to a meet and I forgot my sinklet. Yeah. You gotta wear a sinklet and you got to, all the tests to make sure it's uh what they call those those are the clean lifts. Yeah, I'm lifting with the guys who kind of juice and the guys who are clean. And we do the ones that are clean. I didn't have a sinklet, <laughs> and so we made up a sinklet. We kind of cut up some stuff to make it look like a sinklet at our meet, and uh, that was my wife's idea. Just um, I love the sport. I uh, I uh, didn't care how much I lifted. I love. Um, you know, people always say, hey, how much did you do? Da, 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 da. So I, I competed in the WABDL, which was the World uh, Bench and Deadlift. Um, that was the organization that I that I uh, was a part of. And so I did deadlift and I did bench. And then I try to um, I try to use that opportunity or that platform. When I go into high schools and I watch people lift and I teach a couple of techniques and their eyes just their eyes just go big um, because they feel the uh, that they are able to do something stronger, do something better, just with a small tweak. Man, that that's like the world to me, you know. One summer I came home and Coach Alema Teo asked me if I could go help one of his good friends who was coaching at uh, Kearns High School at the time, uh, uh, Coach uh, Mangale. And uh, I ran their strength and conditioning for the summer. And I loved it. I think I had more fun than the kids did, you know. <laughs> so, you know we started competing against these big man or these strong man stuff that they were doing for the high schools. Kearns, Krugers was eating people's lunch back then. <laughs> Kearns was tough. <laughs> That's awesome. And before we get into what you do now and then you sharing your projects and what you're doing at the U and uh, with your burgers and all that, Let's start first and foremost. The culmination of your life experiences, what would be your message to the world, T? Man, I, uh, from a personal, uh, just appreciate and I uh, appreciate uh, where you come from and who you are. Mm. I think uh, today our uh, identities, um, we're not appreciative. I'm, I'm grateful. I came as I look back. I'm a. I came from a very. I'm still a poor Tongan American, right? My parents uh, clean people's yards and their trash cans, and I grew up doing the same thing. Mm. We didn't have uh, flashy meals, you know. Mm. Mm. We didn't have uh, a lot of things that people luxurious things people had, but I didn't know any different. Right. I appreciate it my upbringing and my parents and their sacrifices. I appreciate learning my language, their language. I appreciated uh, all the cultural things, but I also appreciated some of the adversities that I had faced, mm. whether it was discrimination, whether it was um, just feeling uh, I got the short end of the stick. I appreciated those things. It made me stronger. It made me try to help me be a more critical thinker. And then, I think if you uh, know me, you will know that uh, humor is a big part of my life. Mm, mm. And uh, sometimes I'd laugh things mm. off or I make fun of things. And if I find something I can make fun of you, I'm going to dig in you. <laughs> I, um, and I think that helped me have more of a loose kind of approach when adversity hits, when things happen. Um, there's a lot of things I can tell you. I don't want to get into or pinpoint anything, but the culture nowadays is um, people get offended easily. 
right? Mm. And um, whether it's uh, how you approach somebody or recognize somebody or whatever it may be. <clears throat> I've learned at a very young age not to get offended easily. Mm. And uh, that's helped me in my career. It's helped me on a daily. It's helped me in my relationships with my, with my Heavenly Father, with my family, with my teenage son who thinks he knows everything about everything. About <laughs> my relationship at work, my relationship with anyone. Don't get offended too easy. Don't get offended easily. And then do all that you can to make it right. And so those are some gold nuggets that I was taught growing up. And those are things that kind of hold very strong. Thank you for that message. That is a great message. I'm taking notes and uh, I'm glad to say that I, I do at the, for the most part and I fall off uh, where I feel almost entitled to some things sometimes because of what I've done or what I've put in the work. And then I just turn and get back on track and just be grateful and appreciative, <laughs> yeah. you know, at the same time. So it's not that I'm perfect, but I am able to get back on track, like you said, and appreciate and, and, and all that. So thank you for that great message. Let's talk about um, what you're doing currently and promote those things, like what you're doing on campus um, at the U and then your connection, Terry Burgers. You know, talk about that, please. Uh, so first of all, here at the University of Utah, I've been here going on 16 years. 16 um, years, yeah. Uh, I love it. I came here. I was working uh, as a social worker. Um, I was in the Department of Corrections for years. And um, I still volunteer at the prison system, um, teaching life skills to our um, Pacific Islander uh, inmates, mm. residents is what we call them. And uh, I've enjoyed that. Uh, Bishop uh, Samu Tuwafu, who is... Uh, passed on, uh, reached out to me when I returned home from Southern Utah and asked me if I would cover for him on a Sunday school class at the prison. I told him, yes, I'll do it. That I didn't realize that, that uh, accepting that invitation by Bishop Tuwafu uh, would lead 25 years later and having an opportunity to go once, uh, twice a month to uh, engage at the prison with residents who have made, not made some very good choices, but are very hopeful and uh, are still absolutely wonderful. Mm. So we run classes, we run uh, choir, we run cultural events, we run uh, wonderful things there. So um, prior to coming to the University of Utah, I uh, spent some time as a counselor in the uh, youth corrections and then went on to foster care where some family members and I had gotten into foster care and family preservation. And then during that time, uh, I uh, walked in to check in on one of my clients, a child who was attending West High School. And Dr. Gray, who was uh, serving as principal there at the time, asked me, hey, um, what it, what's it going to take if I can get you to come here and work here? And I said, uh, I can't work here. I can't stand youth. I can't be around them. I get mad easily. I, and she goes, no, I'm being serious. What do you think about it? So I had gone home. And this was 2000, 2001. Uh, I had just gotten married. And my wife's a school teacher from Kahuku. And um, we had talked about it. She had said, you know, you'd be good in high school. I said, absolutely. I'd be going to prison where I work at. And um, long story short, I returned back two weeks later. And I told Dr. Gray, I'd be interested in a position that she would have. She goes, we don't have a position. We'll just hire you and you figure out your position. I just need help with A, B, C, and D. That's awesome, yeah. So I spend, uh, I joined the West High School staff uh, back in 2001 um, as a social worker. And I got to help with a variety of things. And then uh, they brought my wife over who was uh, teaching in West Valley. And she's been there. Uh, she continues to teach out of there. And um, um, about 15 and a half years ago, uh, the University of Utah uh, counselor here, who was serving at that time, by the name of Ferretti Matangi, 
He was the uh, director of the Pacific Islander programs here at that time. He had asked me, hey, I'm, I'm moving on up to another position. They've asked for a couple of people whose recommendation. I was wondering if you'd be interested in applying. I said, nope, I'm nah, not interested. College kids, I cannot work with them. They think they <laughs> These little young adults think they know every no, I'm not interested. Right. So a couple of weeks go by and he says, uh, hey, would you have lunch with them? Just come consider taking lunch, having lunch with the students and visiting with them. And so I said, all right, I'll apply and uh, we'll go through it. Uh, they tricked me. They tricked me into that. So we had lunch and a wonderful people who were here at the time. Uh, Dr. Kaili, who was here. Uh, and many others who were here working uh, encouraged me, hey, these students really felt connected with you. Would you consider? I, before I got back to West High School, I called my wife. I said, hey, this guy's, I think, may offer me a job. What do you think about it? She said, take it. It feels good. So about 16 years later, I'm still here. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> And then the Terry Patty's connection? So my wife's family, uh. the Stones. My wife is a uh, uh, family. Uh, their family had this recipe all the way from Kahuku, where they were all raised at, La Ia. They have this little recipe, and they connected with a meat department. And uh, for the last 20-plus years, they have made... Uh, cherry patties, or cherry burgers. Uh, we jumped on about 20 years ago when we first got married and helped sell it from the Salt Lake area. Well, a few years ago, they reached out as they were retiring, built a home and moved away. And they said, hey, we'd like this company has been so good to us and um, we want to give it to you. We want to share it with you. We know that uh, you guys have been our, uh, with us, loyal with us. So they pretty much just handed us the company. We went and changed everything, of course, to us and everything. And uh, Coach, it's been, a, it's been a blessing in disguise as we look in different ways for retirement and so forth. But different ways that we can connect and make relate and continue our relationships. It's also allowed us to uh, help in different ways. We uh, have a scholarship. A uh, portion of our fun, our, our uh, earnings go into a scholarship that we have under our foundation. But I think it's more of uh, providing a quality product and uh, strengthening, nurturing relationships. Uh, when we get to meet with people, you know, they just call up, hey, you want to get some this? Blah, blah, blah. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to kind of shake their hand and see how they're doing and kind of a check in, you know. And some of our customers have been with us over 20 years. Wow. That's the blessing of the Terry. We don't make any money, man. I mean, if you ask me, hey, let's go, I said, right, let's go get a Slurpee with my win with what I made profit this past week. But um, a lot of it is uh, we try to keep the prices down. This meat company has been great to us for years. So that little formula or that little recipe with the meat, good, grade A meat, and uh, quality hasn't changed, and people keep coming back. And we're trying to figure ways to get it out to where you're at and so forth. But uh, I think we're keeping it local for now. And uh, we're in a, we have uh, four stores that we're in right now. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's, it doesn't, it's, it's not a big time moneymaker. It kind of puts a little few, few things to the side, but it really is about uh, connecting and making relationships. That's relationships. A connection. I like that. We got about a minute. Let's go shout outs. D, who would like to shout out here on the Coach V Show? And for those of you that are just joining, we are here today with T. Kinney Kinney. It is his features. He talks about his success, his life and his experience so that we may draw some valuable life lessons from them. T, go ahead. Shout outs. Who would you like to shout out here on the Coach V Show on Island City? Pretty simple, man. First of all, of course, the Good man above, our heavenly yes, sir. Father and our Savior. I uh, shout out my family, my parents, my grandparents, and those who have come before me, my dear wife and my, my son and my village. You are part of my village, Coach V. 
Uh, you help build all poly sports to where it's at today, but it's more than football. It's what you Sorry. do off the field. Your integrity, your passion, your enthusiasm, your leadership. My family, my friends, my village, my mentors. Um, too many to name, but they know who they are. And yes, um, yeah, I'm just grateful to to have this opportunity to be with you today, buddy. Yeah, yeah, man, it is our pleasure and really grateful. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this episode of the Coach V Show. You will see down on the description all the details it is. Uh, you can reach out to T. He is on Facebook. What else are, are, are people able to reach out to you and make orders for your Terry Burgers, uh, Instagram or just Facebook, T? So Instagram or Facebook, if you're in Salt Lake or in the area, hit me up. We'll try to figure a way to get it to you close if you're in the Salt Lake area. But my main thing is if you are looking for money for school, if you're looking at uh, talking to a mm. counselor for school stuff, uh, school success, any of those things, I'm very passionate about. Whether you go to University of Utah or you're going to school in Narnia, there's a way that we can figure out ways to help you with, um, alleviate the tuition costs and so forth and help you to find scholarships and grants that uh, apply to you and your, your your student and so forth. Yeah. So thanks for coming on the show, Brother T. So please reach out to, reach out to T Kidney Kidney on Instagram and Facebook. I'll put that description down on on down below so you could just click on it and you could see his profile, friend him, follow, and so forth. And thank you, T, for coming on the show and being who you are to the world, just not to me. Because you've been amazing to me since the first time you smiled and started making jokes when I first <laughs> met you back in like 2003. Um, so it's been almost 17 years and you coming down with the lemma and all poly, the all poly foundation to support what it is that we do in our free programs for kids here with the Invictus Youth Foundation. We appreciate your tea and love you. And to everybody else, thanks for tuning in to the episode here on the Coach V Show and on the podcast that launches on Spotify. You can catch it on the YouTube channel. Thank you to Dash Radio out of Hollywood, California, for just really blowing this out all over the world on the Dash Radio app via the Island City channel. And thank you to my brothers, Brother Ammon and also Brother Q for allowing this tongue and brother to have a Hollywood radio show on Island City Media where the beach meets the streets. And finally... Just like for me and T, you know, we just don't ask that you consider or listen to this show for the sake of just success, but for the sake of you being your best. In doing so, you realize the best of your abilities and that everything that you dream, work and pray and, and grind for can be achieved. This is how your boy T, Kidney Kidney, and your boy Billy Amitui by lives all about faith and family, grateful for God's amazing grace. Until next time, from your boy T, Kidney Kidney, the boy Coach V, one love. And respects always. Peace. Thank you, Coach. Thank you.